Welcome into the Kings Beat Podcast. I'm James Ham, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. We are, of course, a Blue Wire Podcast. And today joining me, Mr. Sean Cunningham from Box 40. Sean, what's going on? Hi, James. I, 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 I feel like I miss you, man. It's been a while. Um, yeah, it's been a little while. You get to get this nice vacation. You leave the country and go to, uh, can we say where you went? Yeah, I went to Cabo. Okay, I went to Cabo. Um, I was very jealous. I've, I've been to Cabo twice. And I've never been there at night. Oh, Sucks. really? Yeah. What do you mean? Because never... there's a oh, cruise you come in, you know, you leave it, before the sun goes down. It is some place that I want to go back to in the worst way. But yeah, just, I've had some good times down there. Well, I, I actually, I, this is weird, but I actually have two trips to Cabo planned. Uh, uh, so I hear. I know. Must be nice. So, Those boats yes, and all. You're going to well, set sail and get down to it's not Cook. that i'm not i'm not clay on a boat um okay. but uh yeah we have a, a we had the trip with the boys that we had planned with another couple that brought their kids as well and not really kids anymore i mean like my youngest is 16 going on 17 um and and so we had that trip planned and then after we had that trip planned we had some friends of some friends say hey uh, taking like an adult trip down to like, there's a house that somebody has access to um, that's supposed to be like amazing with his own pool and everything else in Cabo. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's just couples. And so uh, the wife and I are going to go down. It's uh, it's right on our anniversary. So we're going to go down and that trip ended up going from, it was just going to be like four days to all of a sudden it's going to be a week. Um, but we'll do a pod from, I can do a pod from there. And I, I actually, I think I'm going to do the insiders from there for a couple of days. Um, I didn't know that the Wi-Fi in uh, Cabo is better than my Wi-Fi at home. I'm just saying. <laughs> I know. I think I was on uh, your show with Kyle, and I, it might have been the next segment or two segments later. I ended up, um, I ended up getting. I, I was stopped off at a gas station, I come back in, and I'm like, "Wait, there's James. Are they running something old? Nope. Nope. You were joining him from Cabo." I no, like, oh, I, so he can pod from down there. Okay, I like going on, but like I'm podding kidding. when it's an hour plus, and I got you know people coming in, room service coming in, people coming in and out of the place. So it, it was yeah. a little sketch, but first, I'll, I'll first world problems, buddy. First, yeah, world yeah, problems. exactly, exactly. So uh, the good thing is I, I did not get sunburned. Um, I'm still pasty. Um, I, I got a little on the neck. You can yeah. see like see a, little, a little color difference, but that's about we it. You need to see it, but we see it. There it is. <laughs> there, it uh, is. there it is. Uh, but we've got a lot to talk about. First of all, uh, Brendan had, uh, and he had duties today at his, at his other job. Uh, so he could not come on with Sean and I, um, we're going to try to squeeze in another podcast later in the week. Um, uh, because this is a crazy week where things may or may not happen. Um, and, and I think that that's where we'll, we'll kind of jump off. Um, so first of all, let's take care of the business stuff. If you're watching here on YouTube and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, Sean and I've been doing this forever. Uh, we've had this podcast for a long time at this point, and, uh, we appreciate all the feedback, uh, wherever you get your podcast, give us ratings and reviews and all that stuff. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, but, uh, the Sacramento Kings, this has been, a whirlwind like two weeks um and we did like right before i left for cabo we did have a off the record with the kings be virtual happy hour uh, which we plan on doing another one uh now in the month of july um but uh later in the month um we've got a, a lot to talk about sean I, I think the first thing that we can kind of bring up is um you know since we first since we last talked the malik monk situation was like settled and I'm not sure that we talked about that or not, but on top of that, the NBA draft happened um, and all that stuff is super important, but we actually, between the two of us, um, we should probably get into the now. The now is free agency started at three o'clock on Sunday. Sacramento Kings have not done anything in free agency as of yet outside of retaining Alex Len on a one-year deal. And even that, that can't be consummated until, um, you know, until the sixth and, and even then um i think the kings are going to make sure that they've done everything else and before they sign Al, uh, alex len to uh his league minimum deal um but uh you know again the kings are it, it appears that they're not so much on the free agency market as they are 
uh, like chasing a big trade. And, and it's something that you reported over the weekend, which I think sent shockwaves. We had more reporting uh, yesterday morning. But where are we at right now with the Brandon Ingram situation? Because I think that to me is the guy that makes the most sense and the most can be the potentially the most game changing player that the Kings could add at this point. But where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, it's a little little quiet at the moment from at least my standpoint. Um, I feel like both teams know what they're capable and willing to part with and have show interest in and kind of, you know, get a framework of, of things that can be done. Um, I, I would say if you're looking at it from a Pelican standpoint, clearly you are much like the Kings. You're in a win now situation. I would argue that you might be in a more win now situation that even Sacramento is um, because you finished higher in the standings. You just went out and traded for DeJounte Murray. Um, you parted ways with the likes of Jonas Valanciunas, Najee Marshall, um, Larry Nance was in that trade um, uh, for, for, for Murray. And you've positioned yourself to, you know, you're, you're going to have co- big contract go to Trey Murphy and, and um, um, help me out. Who's the other shooter that I just well, blinked on. Who else do they have? Um, uh, well, Trey no, Murphy. The long, yeah. The long, the, the long shooter that they also have on the team defensive player. Oh, um, Herb. Herb Jones, yes, thank you. Herb Jones is under contract, but yeah, Herb, yeah, they, they got him under a good contract. But go ahead. And now, and now you're in a situation where you know Ingram, who, you know, I think they would still like to to keep on their team, but the reality is, is he's big money and uh, he's entering the final year of his deal, and he's attractive to other teams as well. And from a Sacramento standpoint, that's the type of move that I feel they have to make. Um, it's the type of addition that, you know helps him in, in a, as a, as a, as a two-way player, but clearly a, a prolific scorer, a guy who's out there always seemingly in the top 10 of NBA scoring, um, giving Sacramento an ultimate punch. And um, from Sacramento standpoint to make a deal like that happen, um, they're going to ultimately require a third team. And that could be really tricky. And the Pelicans might get in a spot where, Ultimately, you don't see any movement. You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if this goes deeper into the into the off season, and maybe they get to a point where they just feel the plan for now is to hold on to Ingram and uh, you know get maybe closer to the trade deadline. So it doesn't you know anything can happen certainly, but let's be honest. I mean, of the two teams, the Pelicans are the one with the player, and that makes things difficult. It's really, are they, are they willing to play ball? Are they willing to accept what Sacramento can offer? And is there a third team that can get involved? The other question is, I think a lot of it, there's a lot of question marks surrounding Keegan Murray. Um, I don't really have total clarity in the, in a sense of his availability, but I wouldn't expect him to be maybe made available in, in this, in this circumstance. And that's one of the reasons why I think a third team is, um, might be necessary because of the draft capital that Sacramento has. And when you're new Orleans and you're in this like win now position, you know, draft picks are nice, but you're looking at cap room and um, being able to position yourself to compete in the now. And that's what the Kings are looking like as well. Yeah. I I think from everything I hear, the biggest situation that that's kind of holding up. Well, it's that the Pelicans really want a center, right? So they need to find a third team to like work into this deal to get a center. And I don't know, like when you're these, it becomes more complex when a third team's involved. Uh, But I also think that like, look, the Kings have some assets here. Um, I I do know that from what I I've heard, the Pelicans do really like the idea of Harrison Barnes, Um, like just having a, another veteran like CJ McCollum, um, having another guy who doesn't miss games, which would be a really, really big thing for them because uh, historically they've had a lot of players who miss a ton of games and Harrison Barnes is on like what a three or four year streak here in Sacramento without missing a single game. Uh, so that's one thing, but that the third team that needs to be brought in, 
I don't think it's because um, they don't believe in the assets or, or whatever. It's just that they don't have a starting center at this point. And so, again, the Pelicans need to find someone else. And, and I think it's a little weird because, uh, like, what are the Kings supposed to do? Like the the Pelicans need to tell them who they would like as a center, and, and then they need to get a third team involved if that's the way it goes. And I'm not sure who that is. And, and then, like, a distribution of, of assets. I think the one holdup, too, for me, I love Brandon Ingram as a player. I think Brandon Ingram would fit this this roster perfectly. Uh, you know, six foot nine, seven foot three wingspan. He does play defense, um, three level scorer, uh, a guy who averages five point nine assists per game. And I think that's something that Sean, you and I have talked about how how the Kings really do need a, another playmaker. And this is a playmaker. He he's not only a scorer, but he's a guy who can create for others. And I think that that puts him in in my mind in, in a different realm. I also think it's a it's a little crazy because Brandon Ingram's been in the NBA for for eight years. This will be his ninth season, and he hasn't turned twenty seven yet. And it feels like he's been around forever. <laughs> he's actually he's two years younger than Kyle Kuzma, and has been in the league a year longer than Kyle Kuzma. So yeah. if if that's that's to me, it's crazy. The other thing, that, right? He's twenty. He's twenty six, right? He's twenty six. Yeah, he, has, he hasn't yeah. turned twenty seven. He, yeah, he's like two years younger than Kuzma. The other problem is that Brandon Ingram is on a one year, thirty four million dollar, thirty six million dollar deal, and that that limits his value. It just does. Like there. So for people who don't know, I'll go through the salary cap situation really quickly. Um, when you trade for a player, you cannot. You can sign him to an extension when he's traded for. But the extension is very limited, and it's a maximum of two years and 5% raises. And so uh, you can give him a little bit of a bump on what he's already making, the $34 million. Uh, so it prob- I mean, $36 million probably be closer to $38, uh, but it would be like a two-year deal. He's not going to sign that deal at all. So no. like, you've got to wait, and you have to wait an entire six months. And so you wouldn't know if you're going to be able to re- – you might know but you don't know, no, until six months later. So in January, the Kings could start negotiating a long-term deal and sign them to a, like a full-fledged four-year extension, or they could wait till the end of the year and sign them to a five-year extension. Like those are things that could happen, but as of right now, they're not guaranteed. And so, uh, like while Brandon Ingram is a tremendous player and he's young and he fits your your age arc and would slide in and be your third best player like day one. And all of a sudden, that means that Malik Monk and and Keegan Murray are like, in some order, your fourth and fifth best players. I, that would mean the Kings would be pretty good. Um, it's just whether or not you can pull it off. So you got to pull it off. In order to pull it off, I believe you got to find somebody who has a center that makes sense for them, and then work with that. And does that make sense, Sean? For sure. But I also think you know, I, I think um, while the center is nice, I mean, there's still plenty of time for them to go get it. And certainly the likes of, you know, you start looking around the league, it's, can you, can, is Mitchell Robinson an idea is, you know, Clint Capella, Deandre Ayton in Portland, you know, a lot of the usual suspects that kind of come up. So Mm -hmm. I think Portland's an interesting to kind of, I think Atlanta and Portland are two interesting ones to kind of keep an eye on because both of those teams would be certainly interested in draft capital, which the Kings have a lot of. Yeah, I, I definitely. And that's something that I could see happening too. I could see something, um, just like to, this isn't reporting. This is just like giving a framework of something, but where, um, you see something like Harrison Barnes goes to, uh, the Pelicans, um, uh, Kevin Herter goes back to Atlanta with Chris Duarte and, uh, Clint Capella goes to the Pelicans, um, and, and the Kings would get Brandon Ingram in that deal. And like fundamentally that works. And then a team like Atlanta, and that would probably get a first round pick from the Kings. I'm not sure that that you would have any draft capital outside of maybe some seconds going to going to the Pelicans. Um, just in my opinion, like if I'm structuring a deal, if you're getting two players um, and one of those is the starting center that you've been looking for, even if he's on a one year deal, um, then it would that would kind of make sense to me. Um, but who knows? Like I have no idea if Atlanta and is interested on a deal like that. I don't know if they'd be interested in bringing back Kevin Herter, although uh, they did trade DeJounte Murray. So maybe they do have a little bit of a space and they, they gave away AJ Griffin. That was weird. 
um, especially with the Murray trade. Uh, so just some food for thought to like kind of put out there in your mind of, of how a deal like that might work. Um, and, and then on top of that, uh, we have the other, the other conversation. Uh, and that is, um, I, I heard on, oh, was he yesterday morning? So what is today? No, Monday morning, uh, that the Kings had, had got into the conversations with the Utah jazz about, um, about, uh, Lori Markinen. Um, and for me, like Sean, I'll just be honest. I, I don't think that that's going to go anywhere. I, I would be surprised if it does. Um, but, uh, marketing, you know, Danny Ainge likes to ask for the moon and I don't think the Kings are willing to give up the moon for marketing. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I think the reality is there's two things and, and yeah, I, I heard a lot about marketing yesterday and, um, with some folks that I've talked to specifically when it came to him, I, I get the impression that him and his people, uh, Lori Markin and his people are very intrigued by the possibility of entering a free agent market, um, mm -hmm. where you can essentially be the big fish and kind of control your own destiny in terms of a trade. I think it, he has a contract that in a, in a talent level that everyone in the league is going to be salivating for. The trouble is if he's not willing to commit to an extension, um, then it's a one year rental and, good luck in trying to get that asking price that Danny Ainge, I mean, a one, like a one year rental is very difficult to go out and get for someone like him. Um, especially if you're a team like Sacramento, who let's face it, marketing would be nice, but he doesn't put you over the top as a, as a championship contender right away. So, um, you, you would need still other pieces around him. You certainly get in the conversation of being a relevant team again, but, um, and the way it's been told to me is that, uh, you know, I, I, I lean more towards what you're saying, especially people I've talked about talked to recently, because this looks like, yes, there's interest in Sacramento, clearly, just like any other team. And, and they've, you know, gone down the rabbit hole a little bit. But um, as it's been put to me, I don't think it's likely that anything happens with Sacramento. Yeah. And, and the problem is that Danny Ainge is, is likely going to ask for Keegan Murray in that trade. And having Lori market and added to the, the four man core of Fox, uh, Malik Monk, Keegan Murray and, and Sabonis, I think it would put you into like a, a content, a contender in the Western conference. Um, but I don't know that it, I mean, the Boston Celtics are way up here and everyone else is trying to catch the Boston Celtics. Um, I definitely think that it, it puts you in a much higher tier in the West, but when you swap out market in for, Keegan Murray, like, yeah, it's, it's an upgrade today, but what does it look like two years from now? And can you keep them? And the fact is like, look, I, I, I keep breaking this down for people, but Keegan Murray is under contract with the Kings for another two years. And next summer they have the option of, of giving him a rookie scale extension. And that extension will be for like another four seasons. Like there's a really, really good chance that, Keegan Murray is going to be a Sacramento King for like eight years and at a much lower rate than, than anything that marketing or that, uh, that Ingram will be at. Right. So you can look at what Ingram is making right now, 36 million bucks. That is the final year of Ingram's rookie scale extension. And that's kind of where, you know, Keegan Murray will be seven or eight years from now. He'll be maybe a little bit higher than that because, you know, we're, we're more years into the salary cap and the salary cap has increased. But like if, if Keegan Murray reaches the point where he's a max extension rookie scale guy, he still would just be getting to this contract figure that, that Ingram is right now. And Ingram's going to want, you know, a, a five year, $40 million a year deal or something, or he's making 200 million. And so if you're trading for Ingram, it's with the understanding that that's what you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay out. Uh, if you're trading for market and it's the same thing, you're going to have to pay out 40 plus between 40 and 50 million a year for market in just because it's years of service where you already have Keegan Murray locked up under contract for another two years, but realistically another like six. So it, it just makes it more difficult for a team to, to really come to the conclusion that trading a player like Keegan is a smart idea at this point. Um, Where would you land on that? Um, I'm, 
I'm not giving up Keegan Murray. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that that marketing doesn't make you a contender without Keegan. And I, I think if you were somehow to, able to get marketing, that could make you a contender. Um, hey, look at that. As we're talking Orlando Magic, uh, Jonathan Isaac has agreed to a five-year, $84 million contract extension. That's that's some crazy money for a guy who can't stay healthy at all. Um, yeah. yeah, at all. That's, that's per Woj. Uh, but yeah, Sean, it's a good question. Like, look, I, I think that like just like laying out all the cards like on the table and saying, okay, what deals would make sense? If you can get Brandon Ingram without giving up Keegan Murray, I think that Brandon Ingram and Keegan Murray side by side instead of Laurie Market in is a better front court. I, I'd even say the same thing. I think that if you were to trade for Kyle Kuzma, Kyle Kuzma and Keegan Murray are a better front court than if you just have Market in and trying to backfill. That's just my opinion. And, and so I have a, a tough time, especially with a guy who's entering the final year of his deal, um, giving up all kinds of draft capital and everything else. If, if he can walk and, and if you can't guarantee anything, and that's, that's kind of the problem that you have with both of these players with whether it's Ingram or it's Markinen. Yeah, it's, it, it's certainly like, I try to put my, myself in the shoes of a, of a front office, like the Kings, Monty McNair, Wes Wilcox, and those folks, because, um, they they clearly have a spotlight on them, but I don't think they're going to operate in terms of a, out of desperation or they're back against the wall. Um, but clearly, there you know there, there's there's an expectation that they go out there and they dramatically change this this team. Um, but I think dramatically is defined different to many different people, and ultimately you still know that this team wants to build around what they define as their core. Now whether that includes a core four, core three, whatever. Um, we always joke about it. No one's untouchable, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and they've proved that they've proved that before. You're only untouchable until you're not. And I think, I think if I put myself in their shoes, certainly if I think the world of Keegan Murray, which I do, I, I, I you know, personally, I think I can see it. I can see him being that type of player, that caliber, um, I don't know if, I don't think he's a superstar, but I think he could be an all-star worthy type player one day. I could buy that. But the trouble is you're dealing with the now and you have a Fox and Sabonis that have a finite amount of time and you want to capitalize on that very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Is Ingram the type of player that if he verbally gives you a commitment to an extension that you could move off of Keegan Murray for, I, I, I don't know. That could be a bridge too far, but certainly like Lori Markin. And if he was to do that same thing and, and, you know, verbally agree to a, an extension, do any of these, do any of these pieces make me willing to part with Keegan Murray, depending upon what the rest of the package looks like. I also think when I look at where Sacramento's at, I think it's, you know, you, you can clearly look at their team and you can see their pieces and yeah. Kevin Herter and Harrison Barnes get get singled out quite a bit. But I also feel like the two of them might have more value for other teams independently than they do than they would together. Hmm. If that makes sense. And this is also as you've noted in past podcasts, this is the first year where you can actually trade money. You can trade your mid-level exception exception. Yeah. And I think that is a huge, huge feather in the cap for Mar for, uh, or I shouldn't say feather in the cap. I should say an, uh, a tool in the toolbox for yeah. this front office. So um, I'm, I'm really willing. I'm really curious to see how this all plays out because, um, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't gone to a conclusion. And trust me, I've tried to crowdsource a lot of people that I talk to, um, both throughout the league front office, ex front office, um, players, all these things. And there's a very high opinion. On a lot of these people when it comes to Keegan Murray, but if, if you have the heat, so to speak, and however, how, to what notch, to what degree is that heat, you know, simmering, boiling, <laughs> nuclear, whatever it is, do you feel the, the pressure to do something right away? And from what I've been able to at least figure out is I don't feel like this team. I don't feel like this front office is necessarily feeling like their back is against the wall to have to do something. But 
if Keegan Murray is be, is is moved, and you're landing in the likes of a uh, Brandon Ingram, a um, Laurie Markkinen that is extending with Sacramento, maybe not right away, but clearly six months from now, as you pointed out, to where they can make that money uh, more beneficial for the player. Is it worth it, depending upon what that package looks like? And if not, what would that player look like that you would be willing to part with Keegan Murray on? Because in my mind, yes, if Markinen is on this team, if Kyle Kuzma is on this team, if Brandon Ingram is on this team, they are ultimately in that top three of players on the on on the Kings roster and that's what we've talked about at least from my standpoint where they need to add a three-headed monster they need to add to Fox and Sabonis they need help there so you'd be checking that box and yeah in this fantasy world that I'm kind of laying out if it comes at the expense of Keegan Murray what is the player that you need to ultimately get in efforts to part ways with him yeah it's it's complicated man I I gotta be honest um like while I like Brandon Ingram and I like Laurie market and I really, really, really like Kyle Kuzma's contract. Um, I don't think any of those three are good enough to trade Keegan Murray for like, yeah. especially if you're going to have to give up picks. And I, I think that that's where um, like, again, like to revisit, like I forgot there when I had walked through this trade before with Atlanta, this is how I walked through the trade. If you could go, and make this and at Atlanta with Clint Capella going. Uh, so Duarte and, and Kevin Herter, you could give the Pelicans a first round pick in that deal where Harrison Barnes is going there. And so is Clint Capella. You can give them a first round pick and to compensate Atlanta, you can make the 2025, a unprotected pick that they already owe Atlanta and just pull the pick protections and, and maybe give them a second round pick. Maybe that's enough for them to to give up Clint Capella for for Herder and Duarte to match salary and you move forward. So, like, look, I think there are a lot of ways that the Kings can improve. And uh, you brought up the MLE, the mid level exception. Um, there's going to be a lot of things out there about the mid level exception and whether you can trade it and how you can trade it and all that stuff. Um, I did see something from Keith Smith where he's trying to decide. Uh, Keith Smith is from what? Uh, spot track. Uh, spot track. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, he he put out there that the Kings he thought they had about nine point five million of their uh, of their mid level uh, to to use. That's not the case, at least not from the way I look at the the salary cap. Um, he's taking Alex Lynn's contract and adding it and taking it off the top, and so that's not how I would look at that. Alex Lynn is a is a is a veteran minimum scale contract that the Kings would not sign until they actually made a trade. So they'll have their, their full mid-level exception to go out and make a trade. And then they'll sign Alex Lynn after the fact. So just to clarify that, that could push them over the first apron. Uh, but again, the Kings have other ways to get below the apron and to even get below the tax. We already saw that. Um, we saw it with the trade that sent Davion Mitchell and, and Sasha Vazenkov to to the Raptors for uh, Jalen McDaniels. Jalen McDaniels is another situation. The Kings can trade Jalen McDaniels right now, but they can't trade him in aggregate. They can't trade him along with another player. So they have to wait two months before they can do that. But just keep that in mind too, that um, they'll, they should have a trade ship down the road. And I, I also believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Kings actually got trade exceptions in in the Sasha Vazenkov and Davion Mitchell trade. Um, but that's a whole nother story. I, I think that they have like a full like six point something million dollar uh trade exception. Um so the the fact that you you brought up the MLE and what I my point being number one, I think they have a full MLE. Number two, that's also why I don't think Monty McNair has been in a huge rush to go jump into the free agent market for guys like Derek Jones Jr. or Najee Marshall, which I know a lot of Kings fans like. Um, The fact is that you can still go and get these types of players with your mid-level exception, especially when it all shakes out and all the free agents go where they're going to go. And a bunch of teams have like offset. They have weird wonky rosters and they may be over a first apron. They may be over a second apron. Um, It, you know, players like Jared Cunningham could be available players like uh, Robert Williams, a time Lord 
uh, could be available in Portland who makes less than the the mid-level exception. And so those are players that you might be able to trade for for like second round picks and cap relief from those teams. So just keep that in mind. And that's why I think Monty isn't all that concerned about what's happening in free agency right now because he, he either had to dive in one pool or dive in the other and he's chosen to go the trade route initially. Does that make sense, Sean? For sure. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of off season left. There's a lot of options, and you're they're gonna try to swing for the fences, and you know they it's it's a uh, it's tough though because you're ultimately you're 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 doing the hunting right. You're trying to land the big fish, and um, when you're seeking out a player to add to your team, and the biggest thing you can part with is basically draft capital. That makes that makes it tough. We just saw Mikel Bridges and how much, you know, four first, five first round picks, four unprotected, what that looks like. Um, that's obviously a guy who still has team control, but um, it, it's interesting year to year what a value of a first round pick is. And you're, you're a team like the Kings who just finished ninth in the West. You were a lottery team, two wins shy of what you did last year, going from third to ninth and you become, and you're a lottery team. So um, it's a, uh, there's also this thing I think about, you know, always putting myself in somebody, how, you know, kind of looking at it from their standpoint. If you're the front office, if you're, let's say, Vivek Ranadive, who obviously influences a lot of decisions within this organization as well. And if you're him, do you allow your GM to have complete access to the to said draft capital, especially if you do have maybe a spotlight on him a little bit that, that burns a little bright because you want to see what he can do? Um, certainly this man is a a type of personality who is an impossible to please please kind of kind of uh you know gonna gonna always hold your feet to the fire kind of uh influence in over those positions so um yeah it's tough i i try, I try to think about that as well and how that plays into effect and um i i'm just saying that from a speculative standpoint i don't know that for anything i don't know that you know for all i know uh, the front office has you know, full, full reign and, um, support from Vivek to be able to do whatever they can to make this thing work. But it does creep into the mind when you try to think about how truly, what truly a pathway for the Kings to ultimately become a championship contending team or ultimately get to where they want to be. Yeah. I I think like, in my opinion, like Monty has full run, like if he needs to trade the 27, the 29 and the 31, uh, draft first round picks and then throw in pick swaps and 28 and 30. I, I definitely could see him. Like, I think he has the leeway within the organization to do it. It really does depend on who the player is. And as of right now, um, like I think Brandon Ingram or, or uh, Laurie Marketin, they're the types of players that you could take that kind of swing with that you would have to give up three first round picks if they were under contract. But the fact is they're not. Right. And so so their value is much lower. And it doesn't matter what, like whether you think you can get a deal done with with one of them and not the other or not, until you have a deal, you, you can't like go go forward with the assumption that you're going to be able to retain somebody. A lot can happen in six months. And you know, we're talking about the first 30 games of the season or something. What if an injury happens? What if if a player just realistically gets here and he's homesick and he doesn't feel like being here. I mean, I, I like Sean, you and I are old enough to remember uh, like George Hill walking in the door and like very quickly not wanting to be in Sacramento and the Kings having to figure out a way to get rid of a three year, $57 million contract. Um, like, okay, like what are you going to do now? And uh, th- so, so I don't want to like uh, just say that if you, if you trade for a guy, he's automatically going to sign. Um, and I also, you have to consider how much is Brandon Ingram going to cost? That's part of this equation. Is he going to cost 40 million a year? Is he going to cost more than that? Um, I look at the, the contract that OG and Anobi got with the Knicks. And to me, I, I mean, I love OG and Anobi as a player. He, he's a guy I brought up all the time is I think the perfect fit. I'm not giving him 213 million bucks or whatever he got. He can't stay healthy and neither can Brandon Ingram and neither can Laurie Marketing for that matter. None of those guys have, uh, are guys who consistently play 70 plus games per season. They're in the 60s, 
but you're, that that means that you're talking 15 to 20 games a year, you're going to miss one of your star level players. And that's a lot. So a little bit of a risk. Well, um, and yeah, and you look at the, you look at the injury history as well. You know, you have to factor it in, but again, even with someone with like Ingram at being at 26 years old, it's, it's super enticing because I feel, I mean, this guy, even after suffering an injury like that, he is still a top flight scorer. Um, and, has that length and is able to rebound and obviously distribute. And um, I don't know. That's, that's one of the reasons why I get into the conversation about Keegan Murray, because, you know, you can, you can maybe not want to trade him and certainly want to build around him and totally understand, but to get where they are willing to go, you just, you just talked about it. Like Brandon Ingram. I mean, yes, he's a $40 million a year player. Of course he is. Yeah. What, what are we, what are we talking about? Right. Um, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, I think you can make an argument of that's the interesting thing about the system that Mike Brown runs, having a, players like Damana Sabonis. Literally anybody can fit into this equation. Um, there's not a lot of players. Like if you if you can't fit into this type of system, then you're probably not that good of a basketball player when all said and done. Uh, it is, it's, it's a system that requires a level of IQ for sure. But if you move the ball and you can shoot the ball, you're, it, it, you will flourish in the system. Yeah. And, and I'm going to make like one caveat there. I, like I, people always think that I hate Davion Mitchell as a player. Um, first of all, I think Davion Mitchell is, is a very good dude and a really, really hard worker. One of the hardest workers I've ever seen in Sacramento. I put him up there with like Buddy Heald. And I know it sounds crazy because people think I don't like Buddy Heald as well, but I like Buddy. Uh, buddy, you know, it's fun. It's fun to talk about buddy and to, to cover buddy. Um, but buddy, like you could never, ever question buddy Heald's work ethic, buddy, buddy worked his ass off all the time. Um, I, I mean, I think that guy could run marathons. Like he's in such incredible shape. He's, he's, I put Mitchell in the same exact category. The problem I have with Mitchell is that he is straight up a, an ISO type system player a half court iso player and the kings don't play that system and so he doesn't fit and I, I felt like he didn't fit at all the whole time he was here and i actually think he went to the absolute perfect place for him uh yep. in toronto where they seem to take guys like him uh like kyle lowry and like fred van vliet that are underappreciated and help them become what they should have become in the league and so i'm hoping that happens for davion because he's a good dude and I know he works hard and I know his intentions are well and he plays defense. Like oh, he's up. a hell of a defender still. I mean, yeah. I and mean, he's in a weird situation. I mean, obviously you're not the biggest guy in the world and they're for a team that lacks size. You didn't, you, they, they were, they were trying to, they were searching for answers and it's not like he's a knockdown shooter either. So um, yeah. it, it's, it's trust me, Davion Mitchell is not um, feeling sorry for himself. He never did at any point last year, accepted the, the 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 adversity he faced and the challenges that are ahead of him he knows what his limitations are and his bread is buttered where on the defensive end and he tried to make great strides with his shot i think he did and now he gets to go show it with bulk minutes hopefully uh in, in a toronto toronto system where he can hopefully get upwards of 20 minutes a game yeah i i hope so um uh, we'll have to see it all how it all works out for davy on up uh what is it we the north right um, it, it should be interesting. Yeah, it should be interesting. So um, the other thing I, I want to bring up about that before we dive into the why Davion Mitchell uh, and even Sasha Vizenkov are no longer on the roster. But the um, for me, uh, where was I going to go with this? The um, oh, the Sasha Vizenkov and, and Davion Mitchell thing. I want to kind of bring this up. Like, I, I think that like. Good organizations, every organization makes mistakes, especially in the draft. Um, they make mistakes with free agent signings. They make mistakes in the draft, whatever. Um, I think the good organizations in the NBA, they realize their mistakes quickly and they try to move off of them as fast as they can. And I think that the trade that happened here, Sasha Vizinkov was a redundant piece next to Trey Lyles. And uh, when you got to the number 13 pick and, and, you know, Devin Carter is there, um, 
all of a sudden Davion Mitchell became a redundant piece. And the fact that Monty and Wes were able to quickly shop them and get rid of them. And the cost was only two second round picks and, and Jalen uh, McDaniels coming back to me was a stroke of genius and now frees them up with like 8.7 million more than they had the, the day before. And they also moved two pieces that just weren't going to play. They, in my opinion, they weren't part of what the future was. And I think it was a very strong move to not only do that move and admit that, that those weren't the right pieces, but also to do it very quickly while a team like Toronto still had money from the previous season. Like those are that deal was consummated before the start of the 2024 25 NBA season, which is July 1st. So that deal is all behind you. It's all last year's deal. And that's a good thing for me. Uh, I think it, it showed me that like they did this with Rashawn Holmes last year and it cost him a first round pick. This move was way more cost efficient. And it was also like an admission that, okay, we can't keep going down this path. We see where we need to go and let's take care of it now. Um, I can see how you arrived at that point. I don't know that I'd call either one a mistake, though. I, I think it's um, a lot changes in the NBA very, very quickly. I, I don't look at either one of those players as a mistake. Um, clearly, for, for what they built, it's not like either one was a starter or a um, even a solid rotational piece. I think you know Davion Mitchell clearly played very, very well down the end of the stretch of the season um, to where you could rely on it much more, um, but their back end of the rotation or unplayable players. I mean, Sasha's biggest problem was just lack of playing time and mainly due to his health. And I think that is what ultimately hurt them. Um, I don't think it was a mistake to go after Sasha Vizenkov. I don't think it was a mistake to draft uh, Davion Mitchell necessarily. It's, but when, but to your point though, whether you, re, whether you define it as a mistake or you define it as a, it's just not in the right, fit for now um and and you're going to utilize that to make yourself better in an, another area it depends on what you're getting makes sense like in, in at least i don't think it, yeah it no, depends no, on it. like you know if sasha goes out there and you know lights the lights toronto on fire uh and stays within the nba as you know his people want him to do um then you're not looking at that as the mistake would be, how did you let that leave Sacramento? Um, I don't think that Davion Mitchell is going to go out and be a all-star level point guard, but clearly could be a, um, has a, a talent to go out there and, and with the right circumstance, uh, f- be a high contributing player to a team. And, and I hope I wish him well in Toronto, but that just wasn't going to be the case in Sacramento. So to your point, you have to, you know, usually, spend money to make money. And I think mm-hmm. depending upon what Sacramento lands, clearly Jalen McDaniels ain't it, but what do they do with this money? What do they do with this pick? And if this leads to a Brandon Ingram, if this leads to a Kyle Kuzma pick your poison, then we'll have something to uh, truly evaluate. But until then, I don't, I don't, I just don't want to label them as mistakes. It just feels, makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't mean that they are mistakes as in they aren't good players. Uh, they're yeah. mistakes for this roster and for this team. Like they're they're well, they're not going to fit. Yeah. They don't fit, and you need to move. Well, on. well, I mean, but but we. I still think that's an unanswered question with Sasha. You know, especially with his with the with the many games that he missed, um, and and that, that's why you know because like if it's a mistake, then who's the mistake on front office? Mike. Brown? Well, I mean, I I have to be honest. Like if, if I think you I think. You walked into last the off season. Thing. Yeah, ahead, I, th- I think we are too. But you walked into last off season, and you should have been able to see that the Trey Lyles Sasha Vazenkov thing at least had potential to be a major problem where you couldn't play both of them, and you spent eight million on one of them and and six plus million on the other. That and, and I and again, I don't think it's like I'm not just saying, hey, you guys are horrible and you made tremendous errors, but the success rate of like, just say the top 10 of the NBA draft. I well, I would say the failure rate is 40% probably like for every, uh, every draft we could go through, let's just like right off the top of my head, let's just go to the 2017 top 10. 
right? So the first pick, Markel Fultz, complete bust. Uh, the right. second pick, Lonzo Ball. Um, he had talent, but he's not worked out to be it's the NBA a player. As you, well. yeah. you thought he's a total bust. Number three, Jason Tatum. Number four not a bust. is Josh <laughs> Jackson. Josh Jackson is number four. Total bust, yeah. Total bust. Number five, De'Aaron Fox. Number six is Jonathan Isaac. Number seven is Lori Markton. Number eight is Frank and Tilakina, total bust. Number nine is Dennis Smith, total bust. I don't even know who the top 10, who, who number 10 was. Oh, number 10. Uh, the Kings had that pick. They, they didn't draft Zach Collins, but you could even say for a top 10 pick, like pretty much a bust. Like, so yeah, what is that? Yeah, but six I, players. Right. Um, I, I hear you. I think, again, I just, it's semantics, but I think words matter when, when you know fans listen to this podcast and I, I i would just not i just wouldn't label them that i think they're like if you're grading them for example like they're incompletes um they're incompletes because you don't know truly what you're getting with that money and that cap space yet and you may have sent a pretty talented player that could fit in your system that just hadn't yet um mainly due to injury and mainly due to culture shock and what would another year of that look like? And oh, I don't, I don't disagree with Sasha. I, I think Sasha, yeah. another year of Sasha, maybe. But, but again, in order to keep Sasha, you need to make three other moves and, and go get right. like three other long athletic people to play the three, the four, and the five. Which you have to do anyway. I mean, let's be you, honest. You have to do you that do. anyway. You do, but you also like it's the question that I always asked when they were chasing Sasha: Is he better than Trey Lyles? And, and that was like a question that I asked, is he right. better than trail? And they thought he was. And it's like, okay, I like after watching him in a season. Yeah. Culture shock was a huge thing for him. Uh, adjusting to the speed and quickness of the NBA, all that stuff. I actually like him as a player. I didn't hate that at all. I just understand that there's going to come a point where you have to have the other pieces in order to not expose him. Well, like he's yeah, totally and exposed. And we're kind of go around and around, but I just, I just, yeah. yeah one year does not make a player, you know, and it's, uh, it's the same thing you heard from Mike Brown over and over again, you know, in comparison to Monty Ginobili, it's like, there's something there. It's learning the game. And then when you get bit twice by injury for extended periods, yeah. like it just puts you behind the eight ball. And, and in Davion's case, you have limitations there clearly with your size, you can't control that. And, you know, when you're on a team that like, if he was on, let's say that put him on the Celtics, right. He'd, probably flourish because he has so much help around him in terms of length and two-way players that even somebody with him who has a decent offensive game that we could all agree is maybe improving but it still isn't at the at what people would like on the offensive end but he's an elite defender and if you put him on a winning situation like a boston maybe milwaukee maybe miami you're looking at a much different player than you are in sacramento yeah, and I think I think I'll try to. I, I think what you're talking about. I'm not calling the players mistakes as much as I am the moves to acquire those players' mistakes. And that, no, because, I, I understand that, yeah, and, and that's yeah, yeah. what I push back on too. Because I don't fault the front office for that. I don't. Oh no, fault you have to try the, it. Yeah. No, I, I I agree with that too. You have to try it, but once you get into it, and you realize that it's not going to work. I yeah. think it was it was brilliant for them to real okay this is not going to work. Like this we can't do this again next season. But you don't know what you have yet. You know what I mean? Maybe my, maybe my with, whole thing is maybe with say, Sasha but he's almost 29. No, no, no. Jane, I'm saying what did you get? The money that you have, how did you spend it? How have you what have you used? We don't know that yet. That's an unknown. No, so no, you that's position true. yourself and I get you. But if you go out and waste that no, I don't want to say waste. But if you go out there and let's say your move is now I'm just trying to think of one off the top of my head, DeMar DeRozan, whose name is circled around a little bit. Or Which, a, yeah, a, Mark uh, Mark Spears, our friend Mark Spears decided to throw that in that the Kings are dark horses for DeMar DeRozan. Or or like Caleb Martin. You know. Yeah. One of these pieces that I think we would agree might make you somewhat better, but it's it's not putting you in that tier that you want to be in. Right? No, but they're different and I think in this case the Kings needed different, you know, as much as they need better, they needed different. And I still no, think they need like better. No, no, James they need better for better. sure. Right. No, no, they need better for sure. 
at at the number three spot or four spot in their rotation, but they need different overall. They need long athletic defenders that can like right. like you're watching Boston win a championship with like eight of the long athletic defenders that you need. And you're watching uh the Timberwolves and you're watching even uh you know what Dallas was able to do with Derek Jones Jr. And like they just kept adding these long athletic the Kings, they don't necessarily you don't necessarily need I think the Kings need a number three, right? Or a number four. But I also don't think like in the grand scheme of things, if you were to bring this back as like basically the same talent level, I think getting a different player than Kevin Herter would be more advantageous in bringing Kevin Herter back as, as just the same, because you need the long athletic guy. And while that player may not be better than Kevin Herter as a player, you still need one of those, right? Like even like yeah. Derek Jones Jr. and and Kevin Herter, like there you could easily make the argument that that Kevin Herter is a better functional NBA player uh, it, than than uh, Derek Jones. And but but I think the Kings could use Derek Jones more than they could use Kevin Herter this next season. That's what mm. my point would be. Right. Yeah. So no, I, I'm with you, Sean. They have to improve. They have to they have to improve the roster and. and and it, they don't need to make a change to make a change. They need to make a change because they need to, they need more talent because they're right. not good enough. They weren't good enough last season. And that's, you know, again, that's not a failure on everybody. It's just a reality. You won 46 games and you needed to win 48 to get into the playoffs. And even then we're talking about an eight seed. Um, like to me, the, the West is cracked wide open and there are plenty of teams that could take a major step back, whether it's the Clippers or it's, uh, the Suns or it's Golden State, like there are a bunch of teams that could take a step back. The Kings should be in that that tier of teams that are looking to take the jump up into that top three or four with with the OKCs, the um, you know Minnesota, Dallas, Denver's of the world, and even Denver took a major step back when they lost KCP, uh, in my opinion. So um, let's get to uh, let's get to the draft pick. Um, I didn't think Devin Carter was going to be be available at number thirteen. Um, I, 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 under, I understand the Kings um, choosing him at number thirteen. I also think that they probably had a deal or two uh, that they could have made, or maybe they couldn't at that moment, um, and so they they did what was best for them in that moment. And I think what's best for him, like I know a lot of people like Dalton Connect, and were very upset that that wasn't the pick, um, but. Devin Carter uh, check check so many boxes for me. It's crazy, and, and I, I I think you probably feel a little bit similar in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm also stunned that Connect fell as far as he did to the Lakers. Was that 17? Yeah, yeah I I don't know what's He's going fun. on. There, but He's fun. Like, yeah, Connect he, is a lot fun. of fun. Yeah, but but I am with you. I I mean, if I had a draft board myself, Devin Carter. I mean, regardless of fit, regardless of um what regardless of what a team needed Devin Carter would have been what would have been higher on my draft board and clearly I think the Kings went with the best player available um I love the fact that in talking to him you know felt that Sacramento was his best workout um you know we just had the I just wrapped up the press conference this morning and you know from draft day to speaking to him at the press conference to speaking to him in a small little one-on-one such -on -one situation you hear him say, you hear him describe himself as a dirty player, a guy who's, I shouldn't say dirty player, a guy who's not afraid to do the dirty work. Mm -hmm. uh, you One could call him a dirty player. I mean, he gets, he, he's scrappy, man. He calls himself, at every turn, he'll call himself a dog. And I said, what do you want Kings fans to know, and you know, who you are? And he's like, I'm a dog. And that competitive nature is like, sorely needed on this Kings team, which is great. So I would argue that while it is another guard, uh, he's a very unique guard, but um, obviously they make the trade with, you know, to move Davion the, the next day. It's the one thing you have to remember is I think Monty McNair said this best on draft day. When, when it comes to the draft, you're not, you're not drafting for today. You're drafting for down the road. And it's, it's, it's fun. If, you can draft for somebody that checks a box for the here and now. Um, but the reality is that doesn't happen very often. And you, you oftentimes need to draft best player available, especially when you're a team that finishes ninth. 
Um, and what he brings, he's he's unique, man. That that's like a seven foot wingspan. Uh, you can just see it. He's, yeah, he's uh, six two and a quarter without shoes with a seven nine and three quarters wingspan. He's a yeah. plus seven and a half wingspan to height. That's crazy. Yeah, That's I, crazy. I like him too. Like, look, watching him play, um, he is he's the modern NBA. He is what like the soup du jour of the NBA. Like right. the the Bruce Browns, the the KCPs, the you know, like all of these extremely valuable players, even like Josh Hart. Like there are so many of these guys that you can kind of point to and say, Oh, he looks like that guy. And James, to me, it's a Derek compliment. White. Derek yeah, White. Yeah. Derek White. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had two guys. It was funny. I, was, I sent out a bunch of texts after um, realizing myself, like, you know, I don't know that I would go this far, but I got two people within, within a hour completely separately, both say drew holiday. And even I thought that was high praise, but I think if you rewind to where Drew Holiday was, you know, at the time he came into the draft, to compared to where he is now, you know, to me I see the Josh Hart, the Derek White a little bit more, um, I, but I can see what they're talking about in terms of the competitive fire, the way uh -huh. he uses his body, the way he moves, his shot, like. One of the things that I like, I mean, he he had the whole. It, I know it's a little bit cliche, but he gets his he gets his shot off very quick. Um, at least in college, he shot further behind the three point line than a typical college player would. So he's already basically shooting at NBA range. He wouldn't get to the to the line to shoot. He would he'd be a foot or two behind it uh, in a lot of his threes during the season. He he considers him a shot maker and not a not he. he he doesn't take, he talks about the efficiency a lot within his offensive game. And I think mm -hmm. that's just brilliant because so many times you'll hear a shooter, uh, I'm going to use Buddy Heald here as a reference. I mean, how many times you see Buddy Heald be like, I just got to keep shooting. I just got to keep shooting. That's how shooters think. I just have to keep shooting. I have to keep shooting. You, and you in, in doing so, it's like, yeah, it's going to come around. It'll, it'll probably work for you. Get back to where you're, you're getting that streak. But Devin Carter doesn't look at himself that way. He looks at, I need to be efficient. I need to be efficient with my shooting, with my scoring and what I bring to the team offensively. And then defensively, I'm going to be up your ass. And that's, that's something that's going to be sorely needed for this team. Yeah. For me, he's a, he's a scorer. He's not a pure shooter and, and that's fine. Like he, I also think he's a three level scorer. Um, I he think he'll work on his, score. yeah. yeah, he'll yeah. work on his mid range game. Uh, defense is where he's going to hang his hat. And you know, I, I know people are like, well, he's another small guard. Like this is not Davion Mitchell, just so people like Davion Mitchell's uh like I don't think he's six foot tall, but if he is six foot tall, his wingspan is like six one, six two. This is a dude that can hang with players much bigger than him. Forty two inch vert. He can play above the rim. Uh he also like he's crafty and he has it's the intensity that he attacks with that I think separates him from a guy like Davion. Like Davion when he's going to the rim, like, okay, like there are moments where it's, it's fine, but that's also where you see that he's undersized. Like that's not the way that Devin Carter attacks the rim. Like he taxi a rim, the rim with force and like, look, I, I really, really like the pick. I don't care. Like all these people are like, Oh my gosh. Now they have seven guards. Like, okay. One of them is already gone. And Davion Mitchell, we already know that they're shopping Kevin Herter. I don't think that's any secret. He's in every trade package that anyone is bringing up. Uh, it's very clear that they shopped him at the deadline and they shop, they're shopping him again right now. Uh, Chris Duarte, whether he's part of the plan or not, he's on a one year deal. And I would say he's more likely to not be part of any plan moving forward. And then one of your other guards is a, is a guy you converted from a two way contract and we can all love Keon Ellis, but he's on a league minimum deal for the next two years. And I think that's spectacular. And I think he's earned his spot in the league. But again, he's not a sure bet yet. He's a, a player who's really played about 60% of one season and shown some flashes, and you think he can be a player. You add that to Monk, and you add that to, to De'Aaron Fox, you really don't have a lot of guards. There could even come a point in this particular offseason where they have to go get another guard. Like, if you end up trading a couple of guards, you might have to go get another one unless you think that the combination of Colby Jones and and uh, Keon Ellis 
and uh and Devin Carter can hold down like a good 40 minutes a night plus so I think it's interesting uh, I was totally I was surprised he he fell to 13 I was surprised the Kings didn't trade the pick but when they didn't trade the pick I was like oh okay this one makes sense what did you um what was your biggest surprise for the draft um Ron Holland going number five I thought that that was a surprise, although I really Mm. like Ron Hall and I would have been fine with him in Sacramento. Um, I'll just say like when, when I did draft prep for this year's draft, like because we've been around Monty and West for a number of years now, like the first thing I do is like cross out every 18, 19 year old player off the draft board. And so I did focus on a guy like Dalton connect. I did focus on on a guy like Devin Carter, uh, you know, Tristan De Silva, like all of these guys that, that are seasoned veteran college players, because if the Kings were going to draft, that's who they were going to draft. They were going to draft one of these guys that are, you know, old sophomores or, or juniors or seniors. And, uh, so I don't know. I don't know that there was a lot of other surprise. Oh no, Zach Eady at number nine, which is stunning. Um, I, I watched a national championship game like everyone else did and just watched that dude get torched in defensive sets and switches. And I don't know how that's going to work at the NBA level, but, good for memphis like if you think he's going to work out maybe you can cover him with uh with jaron jackson jr but i don't, I don't know about that um, to me i like it i like him with memphis because of the i mean it's kind of like stephen adams and and you know and and jaron jackson again um you, except you know, for stephen adams I, can I, really move his feet I, I told you i was i told you i said zach Eady will be a lottery pick Whew. and now, did I think he's going to go nine? No, but I did think he'd go top 15. Um, my, my, I think my biggest my biggest surprise still is Dalton Connect falling the way he did. Um, that I just did not see that happening. Um, but I'd, I'd honestly put number two, Devin Carter going to the Kings. Mm. Because yeah. of all the players that were going to fall out of the top 10, he was probably the least likely in my book and certainly with Zach Eady jumping into the top 10 someone had to come down and I didn't think it would be I didn't think it'd be him uh so yeah that was a uh that's that's a pleasant surprise I think you know Kings fans should be really really excited about what they have uh in him and you know I, I also when you talk about untouchables I mean, no one's untouchable but that might be close <laughs> Because having him at team control for as long as they do right now, and certainly, you know, there was talks about trading the pick and they could still trade his draft rights and all that stuff. But, um, boy, I, I think that would be a tough one to tough one to move right now. Yeah. The, the only thing that, again, I, like I've mentioned this on the air and I'll, and I'll be honest with you, the only thing I've heard of why he may have fallen is there were concerns about a shoulder injury. Right. And we're still we're still up in the air. We don't know if he'll play at the California Classic this weekend. Uh, due to the shoulder injury, we don't know when he will play. We like, and, and it's possible he does play this weekend. Uh, we don't know yet. That the King said that they needed their medical team to look at him. Um, I'd also like look if, if there is a point where you think you had a really really good workout, and um, like we saw this a few years ago with with Tyrese Halliburton, where like maybe the the shoulder injury is a little bit of smoke and mirrors to get him to a better location. Uh, I don't know. Like you never know. Those things always. Those things can happen, uh, but I think we're in a wait and see to just kind of, we'll know more. I think we'll know more by the end of the week about his injury, and maybe we won't because I don't think we get a lot of clarity at all from from the Kings at this point when it comes to injuries, but um, I would like to at least know what what the the prognosis is and and see what kind of time frame. If there is one, there might not be. Um, yeah, they, hmm. and just to kind of tie that up a bit, you know, today's press conference, it was asked, Monty McNair said that they won't need to get him with his doctors. I mean, he, he literally flew into town yesterday. And part of the reason that the press conference was, was so late, you know, not every team, every team ends up doing summer league in Vegas, right? But not everybody does a second summer league like the Kings do with California classic. Certainly you have the Utah one, uh, you know, Philly, Oklahoma city, Utah, and I think it's Memphis. Yeah, actually it is Memphis because Devin Carter's father, Anthony Carter, who was an assistant coach on George Carl's staff here in Sacramento, yep. um, is also an assistant coach with the Grizzlies now. And 
he's leaving from here to go to Utah. So part of that was to allow, you know, these kids, the, the, the draft uh, Carter in this case to go home, you know, make arrangements because the next few weeks is Gone. summer league. It's basketball. You, you're not seeing the end of July. Yeah. So um, gives them a chance to kind of get ready for what's ahead and getting in here on, on Monday or Sunday night, I believe um, was ultimately the best thing. Then Sunday they take you and you have your own little media day, uh, try on new uniform. You're going to get, you know, a whole bunch of photo shoots and then you go before the wolves, the media on, on a day like today. And yeah, you've got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to basically get accustomed to your new teammates. And if you are going to play in the classic, great. Um, I can tell you Monty McNair kind of, seemed as if he wasn't too concerned whether he plays or not or or if the injury was was going to bother him or not um but they got to get him with the doctors first and later this week we'll probably know whether or not he'll be playing because obviously the game is saturday and um you know we'll hopefully be able to talk to him before then yeah um let's see the one other surprise on draft night was the filipowski thing and Oh boy. Yeah, that's weird. That is a a uh like a rabbit hole that I'm not sure anyone wants to jump down. <laughs> but there's some crazy I, ass there's <laughs> some crazy ass shit going on right there. And I, I think you might want to look at that if you're out there. Um like that dude was taking a like a twenty six year old to prom when he was sixteen. I don't know, bro. Uh, I'm the whole uh... thing. The whole thing is, uh, well, maybe not, maybe not, maybe 24 year old. Yeah. The whole thing is very odd and very uncomfortable and, um, very, uh, made for not TV movie made for uh dateline. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even want to touch it. It's, it's just, oh man, it's, it's a weird one. It's a, it's, jump in, check it out. It's a little, yeah. it's a little crazy. All right. Uh, me, before we, it makes me anxious. We, yeah, it does make you anxious. Before we tie this, uh, we wrap this one up. Uh, let's get to the business of basketball. Sean, I'm going to do the thing I do every single time. Oh, are they going to make a move? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I mean, uh, how do you define a move? Are you saying are I they mean a real a move? I mean, they get they're they're they switch out a starter. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. What do you think it is? Now, now will it? Well, now see, this is where you see? piss me off. Uh, uh, no, I, I look. I, I think for sure. I think honestly, I think there's going to be a change in the starter, even if they run it back. Oh. Uh, I think you have enough. Um, you're going to have enough changes on this roster, even without making maybe the headliney, you know, blockbuster trade. And uh, even if you make a smaller trade, um, I think you have enough to where things are going to get shaken up a bit. So, yes, I think a change for sure is coming. Um, is it today, this week, two weeks from now? I, I, I could see this thing going into Vegas and a lot you know, changes because Vegas becomes the hub of all things basketball, not even just the NBA. I mean, you got all these AAU teams that end up going down there. It's, it's crazy. So um, it will become the hub of all things basketball. And. Uh, a lot of meetings will take place and a lot of, you know, whining and dining take place and uh, big time decisions end up coming out of Vegas as well. So uh, you'll enjoy with the basketball that you have. You'll enjoy some looking at the likes of hopefully Devin Carter and, you know, Colby Jones yeah. uh, and, and we'll see what that looks like. But, um, you know, the two, the new two way players that they'll, that they'll have under their belt, which is, you know, Isaac Jones and Isaiah Crawford. I think there's, will be an interest yep. there. Um, and even though, you know, you didn't, you won't see you, you didn't see the Kings pick up the qualifying offer for Jalen Slauson and um, Jordan Ford. I think both, both of those are still be on the summer league team. So that, that roster will be announced probably within the next day. Uh, they should have done it already to be honest, but yeah, um, they might be waiting know, and, for medicals. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, a lot of that has to do with Mr. 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 First round pick there, Mr. Number 13. So no, that's what I mean. Yeah, 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 I think I think that that might be what. Okay, so I asked the question. I also believe they will make a major change, and like, if not, like if they run it back, I would be slightly surprised. Um, but I should never say that. I would say though, if you come out of 
like if if you miss out on free agency and you miss out on the trades and you walk into the the deep dark you know venture of the off season without anything done and this is your club i, I think that there's going to be it's going to be a really really interesting awkward you know couple of months because i i, I don't know i i think, I think if, if, this team does need to make a move so i'm getting here real quick because i think if you do it in this way and and this might be fun but a lot of these names that we've heard you know throwing around um kings don't really control their destiny with them you know they're they're going they're trying to be the hunted and the decision isn't really on them as to whether or not they can pull this pull something like that off i mean it takes two to tango as we say but in terms of likely versus unlikely or how you would grade it, maybe a 10 meaning it's going to happen and a one meaning it's not going to happen. I, I'd put it like this. Like the only thing I'm pretty can, can uh, let's see, I'll put Kuzma here. I've got Mark and I got Ingram. Anyone else you want to throw on the, on this list? Probably. Uh, we could do Cam Johnson, I guess, which I'm not a huge fan of, but Cam? that's okay. Okay. Not, not that I dislike Cam Johnson. I just like, again, he, he's just a jump shooter. And then what about like a DeRozan? Oh, he's well, DeRozan. If you do get DeRozan, you're getting DeRozan on like a mid level. I don't think you're doing a sign and trade for DeRozan. Yeah, I think the Lakers because I know that was kind of it's. He's always linked to them, but just being an LA guy, that would probably have to work there more so than Sacramento. But I'll just all right. That's fine. These four, I would say, the least likely of those three, in my opinion, is Markinen. I agree. I would put I would put that at like a two. Um, I think the second least likely is Kyle Kuzma. I'm going to put that at a four. Okay. Who, who are we dealing with Cam Johnson as well in this? Yeah, I'll put Cam Johnson in there. Um, at number two and then, and then number one would be, well, no, well, I'm no. saying I'll, I'll let you do 10, your list. 10 being the, the highest likely that they could land. Okay. One being the least likely that they'd land. I put Markin in, I give it a two. Kuzma, I give it a four. Cam Johnson, I'll give a six. And Ingram, I'll give an eight. Okay. I would do a very similar, except for I would swap Kuzma and Cam Johnson. I think Kuzma is more available and I don't know. Although I, I do think that Jordy Fernandez is like, hey, if you want to swap out Cam Johnson for uh, for Harrison Barnes and give me a, a vet that I'm comfortable with that I can work with, then I'd be okay with that. I'm going to change one. Oh, I'm going to give I'm going to give Ingram a six and a half. I'm going to give him like a six and a half, seven. Yeah, eight seemed a little a little. I was strong. trying to. Yeah, it's it's too strong. I just wanted to put it above Cam, but because uh, I had Cam six, but realizing that. 80% likelihood that he comes to the Kings. I I'm not putting it that high. So no 6.5. Yeah, no, no. And, and like, look, uh, there's a possibility two of those guys. Like if, if you're looking at the two guys in the middle, you never know the, you, you have the assets to go get both of those guys because they don't make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean like a herder and, and Duarte for Kuzma and a first round. Oh, well herder as Duarte as, at first and Kuzma as, would work. As much as Kuzma, I think, would be a nice fit with Sacramento. Um, I'm getting, I don't know this to be true. I just kind of feel like it's a hunch. I just get the, I get a feeling that Washington doesn't want to move off of him for, for the way, I mean, his contract is so team friendly. I get and the feeling production. that they, they have no idea what they're doing. And <laughs> no, no, like, I, but literally, like, I, they're caught in the middle. Like, why do you go out and draft Alex Sar and then sign Valanchunas for a three year, $30 million deal? And well, that's easy. Sar's well, 18, no. right? Well, I'm not done yet. Oh, On okay. top of that, you went out and you re re upped Rashawn Holmes. So yeah. they were able to convert Rashawn Holmes this year contract into like a slightly less contract, put that money on next year as a non-guaranteed like $13 million deal. He probably won't see that. Um, but that's still three dudes. And then they go out and they trade Denny Avisha for Malcolm Brogdon. And I get it. They got a great deal there. 
because they got two first round picks for him, which was stunning to me. I don't know how you got two first round picks for Denny Avisha. Um, but also I like Malcolm Brogdon. And I, I think if you're all of a sudden, I, this is what I mean. I think that they possibly could convince themselves that a core of, of pool and Brogdon and Kuzma and Valanchunas with young players at the wing and what Koulibaly and, mm. um, and then, you know, again, like Alex R and, and like the Corey Kispert still there. Sar, Sar is not going to be ready, but Kispert's a player. Yeah. But I, I'm thinking that it's possible that they've convinced themselves that maybe they could compete for a playoff spot or a play in spot in the Eastern conference. And so maybe they don't trade Kuzma. That's right. all I was getting to. So. Yeah. I, I just, I, I yeah, I, I, I get you. I'm, I'm a little bit in agreement there. I, I could see them not doing that. And, you know, they're going to give Sar all the time he needs. So, no, I think that's at the I NBA level or elsewhere. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Um, okay. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the, the King Speed podcast. We'll be back on, on, we're going to try for something on Friday with Brendan here as well, uh, because that'll be a build up to the Cal Classic. And hopefully we will have had some sort of movement between now and then. If we don't have that much movement, maybe we push it back a little bit. Um, but we're going to try to fit in another pod here in the next couple of days. Um, Sean, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I was out at Malik Monk's basketball camp. That was a lot of fun. I wasn't able to talk to him on camera, but spent a lot of time with him uh, uh, in between his duties with the, with the, with the camp. And first of all, um, you know, he's like a fan favorite here and that should, should surprise nobody, but that camp sold out so fast. Oh. <laughs> like, I, I mean, it was cool to see that. It was cool to see, you know, 65 kids from a, from Del Paso Heights make their way to uh, this camp. Be, thanks to golden one being able to sponsor that. Mm-hmm. And um, just really incredible. And, in, and in having some conversations with him uh, and spending some time with him a little bit was, it was fun. He flipped me off like he always does. And uh, told you to F off. You know, yeah. He, uh, he admired my sunglasses and uh but no, I I was sitting there minutes before the, I was sitting, I was with him. And then, and then, you know, the Contavious Caldwell Pope deal to Orlando happened. I just looked at him. I said, I think he probably should cut you a check, Yeah, you know, and he, he laughed and, and, you know, said, Nope, my, I'll get mine on the back end. It'll be fine. So mm. everyone's on the same page. No, it's good to see him. I'm glad he's back. I'm I'm glad he's able to do a camp here. Um, like talk about just like giving the Kings the biggest like green light to go have a better off season. Um, like him saying yes that early was spectacular. Yeah, yeah I, I think yeah, like big. that right there was about a big as big a team player move as I've ever seen. Because it, like the uncertainty that would be right now with the Kings. And what Sunday would have looked like and felt like and what the, you know, the possible possibilities could have been, that would be a little nerve wracking for, for fans who are already on edge, who are already wondering if, uh, if Jalen McDaniels and Alex Lynn are the new, uh, <laughs> Glenn Robinson, the third and, uh, has on white side moves from a couple of years ago. And that's it. Uh, wow. no, you, you got your, uh, you got your, your, I, I think, that move right there, the Kings already did not lose the off season. They didn't win the off season yet, but they didn't lose it because they could, they would have lost it if they lost him. And it would have been really still tough plenty to of time to lose it though. <laughs> so That's still, a winning move for sure. And Devin Carter is a winning move for sure. But if, if this, this could all go, this could all blow up in their face. <sighs> wow. Sean said it. Uh, all right. That's going to do it for this edition of the King. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, my final thoughts, uh, just be super careful like the weather is wild and it's going to be that way for like the next two weeks. So, uh, drink a lot of water. This is how Kyle, uh, ends every show, uh, drink water and be kind to, uh, be kind to each other. Um, but, uh, I, I definitely drink water and just be cautious. Like 4th of July is fun and I'll be on the water the whole day and hanging out. But, uh, it's, a it's a little bit, uh, crazy with the weather. The weather's going to be what's it, 114 tomorrow in Sacramento. I don't know. It's, well, it's, I like it hot. I don't like it that hot. Uh, no, but it's you know I can handle 100 degrees. What I don't like is if it's going to go you know 12 straight days of 100 plus degree temperatures. That's that's rough. That's tough on everyone, pets and you know 
just what I what I like, Sean, is that for a lot of people, I, I can get into my phone and I can go press a button on an app and and set my car temperature to seventy two when I get out to the car, and it's not like oh my gosh, what is happening? I can't <laughs> sit down in my own car. Yeah, no, it's nice. So, anyway. You're All right, not, you're not helping your many your fleet of boats that you have, and the this house on the lake. Oh, we live Sean. different lives, my guy. Sean. Uh, All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat podcast. Uh, We will be back hopefully later this week with Brendan Nunez in tow. Uh, So for Box 40, Sean Cunningham, I am James Hamby, King's Insider for ESPN 1320, the King's Beat. See you soon.